Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, and thank you very much for joining us in this video. We hope that you are well and, and healthy and safe. Hopefully you're staying safe and doing everything that is needed to uh, contribute to the, um, the survival of this pandemic. And um, we're prayerful and we're very optimistic that the Lord will bless us to make it through this season uh, in a decent amount of time. And we can look forward to the day where we can get back together, we can worship and we can praise the Lord in person. But we want to continue to hopefully encourage you and share a few things with you from the word of God. And today we're going to do a, a consideration or a topic that um, is very well known. Um, we're going to do something, uh, read a passage that we know you have read probably several times before. But we want to hopefully uh, provide some sort of clarity and, and maybe a bit more of an understanding to this uh, very familiar passage. But we want to talk about the world as God imagined it, right? Uh, we want to talk about that because a lot of times in our worldview, we think of the world in terms of what we can create out of it. In fact, that's the Western mindset. That is the American initiative to formulate a reality that is uh, man-centered and man-focused and even man-created. But the truth is we want to, as Christians, imagine the world as God imagined it as God wanted it to be and as God designed it to be. So to do that, we have to first establish that there's an authority outside of ourselves, meaning we are not responsible for dictating what the world should be like. Uh, there is someone who is far more capable, far more responsible for doing something like that. And uh, that is God. So we have to put that at the forefront, because if we don't, then we are all left to do whatever we would like to do with um, creating our own reality. Secondly, we have to accept that authority through God, but by his scriptures, being that he has given us a record, uh, being that God was so competent enough to leave a reliable and consistent way of determining how his will can be interpreted. We must accept as Christians, as believers of Jesus Christ, that there is something uh, left for us to determine what this world should be like. Um, and we think that this is probably the most firm and sure way of coming to this, this uh, conclusive way of how God would like the world to exist. So we're going to set those premises uh, in the forefront because that allows us now to have a common ground on how we can go further in understanding the world that the Lord designed. So I want us to look at John chapter one and really not just John chapter one, but we're going to use it as a, a text to begin with. I really want to look at three concepts that are found in the writings of the Apostle John. The first concept is the concept of life. OK, John talks about life in a way that is brilliant. It is beautiful. It is poetic. It is full of uh, Hebrew tradition while also utilizing Greek rhetoric, all right? So he is a very unique author. And not only is he this sort of finessed scholar, not really his, 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 his approach, he is more of a mystical prophet, okay? John is caught up in the visions and the revelation of, of Jesus Christ, and he writes from that viewpoint. So the first concept that we will discuss is the concept of life that he writes about so adamantly throughout all of his writing. The second concept we're going to write about, or excuse me, discuss, is the concept of light. All right. So we have life, then light. And then lastly is his concept of love. All right. So there are three concepts. Let's go over it again. Life, light, love. All right. Those are the three concepts. And we'll see that at least the first two of those in the first chapter of the book of John. Now, when we look at the first chapter, obviously the very popular passage is verses 1 and 14, sort of the uh, explanation of this triune being known as Jehovah. And we utilize that to justify the personhood of God as revealed through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see this as being a core text. But I'm worried that whenever we do that, 
And surely, obviously, there are uh, implications of that in this chapter. But I, I, I believe that whenever we do that, we miss the point. And that is obviously um, uh, uh, motivated by our uh, desire to try to put as much, much of an explanation on the miraculous Godhead that is in many respects uh, undefinable. I mean, we're talking about a miracle. We're talking about Jesus who is known in the Bible and declared in the Bible to be God. That's very hard to put into words and to wrap our minds around. So we're very limited in that respect. But more to the point of John in this chapter is explaining the purpose of Jesus coming in the flesh, what that means to the believer, what that does to the creation, how that transformed the person who will believe that this actually happened. And he starts off by saying, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. Now, obviously, the word word that he's using here is used to depict the logic of God, the rationale, that is the logos, right? In the beginning was the logos, the mind of God, the thinking of God, the intent of God. OK, all of this was there in the beginning. Now, when we read throughout this first chapter, we see that John is introducing this theme within a context that presents the world as being dark. OK, and not so much the world being dark, but really the world is light. But the people who make up the world are full of darkness. That is, everything is full of life and light. But somehow or another, the people, mankind that abides in the world and therefore makes up the world in many instances and in many ways have intrinsically become dark. We know how that happened, and it is because of the fall of Adam. But notice the context. Notice the setting that he is putting this explanation in. It is a creational setting. It is a setting that is, is pulling us back to the very first days of the beginning. And he wants us to see and understand that there was someone there, and that was Jesus Christ, who is God. OK, this is an amazing way of putting this. He says this in verse number two, he existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. So not only was the word there, but he was active and involved and in establishing the arrangement and the design of the world. Now, verse four is where we get the first concept. He says the word gave, li gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. Now let's break that down for a moment. The first thing is the word gave life to everything. Now, when we look at this whole scenario that John is painting for us, he's telling us the first principle. The first principle is that from Jesus, from the word comes life. Okay. Now, if anything is created, since it was created through the word, then it must have life. Okay. But here's the thing that is interesting about that. The interesting thing about that is since everything should have life, everything that has life should now have light. And that light, he says in verse number five, it shines in darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. That is put it out or as the King James Version put it, comprehend it. The Message Bible shows this life light as breaking out of darkness. It breaks out. It is a breakout life light that it just burst out and there's nothing that darkness can do about it. But here's the problem. If the light breaks out of darkness and if light cannot be extinguished by darkness, the question is, why are men dark? OK, why are men dark? And here's the fundamental problem that we're facing in this first chapter. It is not as if darkness came and overthrew light and now men are filled with darkness. But rather what John is painting for us in the first chapter is the tragic thing that happened to mankind whenever they voluntarily were placed into darkness by the actions of Adam. OK, 
Adam did something to us that seriously comprehended the existence of mankind. And as a result, it has in many ways impacted the arrangement of God in a way that only God himself can fix. All right. So then when we read further, we start to see how this light is now breaking out in new ways. OK, this light that has always been in existence, that has always been present. It is now breaking out in new ways and it is causing a sort of an effect on mankind that will allow them to not only have life, but to also have light. All right. Now, look what it says. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now, I want you to notice what's happening here. This testimony about Jesus Christ is a testimony about how the one who is the light, who is the light and life giver, is all of a sudden breaking into the world in an attempt and with the intention to do something to those who are being held by darkness. OK, now this idea of darkness to be captive by darkness is to not have life and to not have light. It is a beautiful motif that John uses here to help us understand the impact that Jesus has on the human being and ultimately the world. Now, here's the point that I want us to see in verse number 10. He came into the world. He created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. When we read these first 13 verses of the first chapter of the book of, of the gospel of John, we find out something, a few points. The first thing is the world is not what it looked like when God first created it. The second thing is it is God's responsibility to fix the world that has somehow become unlike what he originally wanted it to be. And the third thing is Jesus came to do just that. All right. Th th this is the beauty of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about Jesus, we're not just talking about the one who died on the cross and paved the way so that we can all ultimately go to heaven. Yes, that's absolutely a part of it. But as we reflect and continue to reflect on resurrection, we now see that Jesus is the way the world gets put back right. He is the way that the world comes back to its original place. And then from that place, he flourishes the world into a new existence so that it can become even more of what the Lord ultimately wanted it to be when he imagined it from the very first day. Here's the key thing to this entire understanding. When God created the heavens and the earth, yes, it was good, but it was not complete. Yes, it was beneficial, but it was not mature. Adam, nor any other human being, save Jesus Christ, could perfect and mature the creation in a way that will allow it to ultimately be everything that the Lord imagined from the very beginning. That is why from the very beginning of creation, we see there's evil and there is a serpent there that is even in the place of, of, of or in the mindset of Satan, if you will, an adversary to oppose the very will of God. These are all things not indicating the flaws of creation, but the imperfection and the immaturity of, correct, of, of creation. And John is testifying here that the one that created all things has finally stepped foot into the world to mature and perfect the very things that he created in spite of all that has happened to destroy the work that would ultimately come through his life and his ministry. This is a powerful testimony. Now, in response to that and to re in response to everything that Jesus does, what we're seeing is that since Jesus is life, and since he brings light, then there's a responsibility placed on those who are born again. As John says here, 
We are reborn, not with physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Something happens. And that is our third concept that is found all throughout the writings of John. Those who are filled with life are therefore filled with light and therefore must love. All right. I want you to look at what John writes in first John chapter two, verse number seven. He teaches us that since we now have been born again, now that we have been given life and given light, we are to carry out, carry out the same things that Jesus carried out because Jesus ultimately is life and light and he is the expression of God's love. Look at what he says. Dear friends, I am now I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the message, the same message you heard before. Yet it is also new. Now, the question is, how is it new? He says in one breath, it is old, meaning that this is the way the Lord always wanted it to be. This is the way God always intended for humanity to act and to live. But somehow or another, that has been misinterpreted and the creation has gone a different way. Specifically, mankind has gone a different way. He says, but this is how it is new. It is new because now we're interpreting all of these intents through Jesus Christ. That is the bodily example of Jesus Christ, what he did and how he portrayed this love and this life and this light. He says this, Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is all ready shining. All right. So here it is, brothers and sisters. This is how the Lord imagined the world. He imagined a world where there is no darkness. You may say, well, what does that mean? Well, it is a world where people are filled with life. They are filled with light. And because of the life and the lights that is in them, they are overwhelmingly loving just as Jesus was loving. OK, so if we can ever say, what is the ideal world? What is a world where God can say he is pleased with the world? It is a world where people through the life and light that is in them. They are the biggest and the greatest lovers of human beings and all things God created. All right. Notice what happens here. If anyone claims I am living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is, is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. Now, there are two things that we can pull from this passage. Love compels us to be loving to each other. And the second thing it does is it allows us not to cause our brother and sister to stumble, meaning we should be doing everything we can to help each other live in light, in life and in love. All right. Anyone, he says, verse number 11, who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go having been blinded by the darkness. Well, brothers and sisters, everything that we've read so far, and these concepts are found throughout all of John's writing, it teaches us that there are three fundamental things that must be found in the world in order for the world to become everything that God wanted it to become. The first thing is it must be the life that comes from Jesus Christ. This is an exclusive life. It's not life that comes from any other source or any other thing or any other person. Even life is found in Jesus Christ. The second thing is that life must be light to us and it must allow us to become light. That is through Jesus Christ. We illuminate the world to the existence of a creator who has designed this world to operate a certain way. And ultimately, the third thing is love, which can only be birthed through the existence of life and light, which comes from Jesus Christ. When this thing happens, when these three things are found, then the world ultimately gets better and we find ourselves existing in a world where Jesus 
is present and where God is satisfied. Here's the problem, brothers and sisters. We have a hard time finding uh, uh, ourselves loving the way the Lord wants us to love. And ultimately, mankind tries to find life and tries to find light in things that can only lead them into further darkness. So I want to encourage everybody to look for Jesus to bring you life, light, and love. And then look to the Jesus to help you be life, light, and love. All right? Bring life to situations. Be a light to those who are trapped in darkness. And learn the secrets and the, the power of loving people the way Jesus loved us. And I believe, brothers and sisters, when we all do this as a collective effort, we will gradually see our world become everything that the Lord wants it to become. I want that. I want that for myself. I want that for my children and my children's children. I want this world to ultimately become everything the Lord wants it to be. And look here, brothers and sisters, this is exactly what the Lord has commissioned us to do. Really, we have no, uh, we have no uh, option to do anything other than what we have read in this text. And I believe when we do that, we'll fulfill our Christian duty in the most glorious way possible. All right. So I thank God for you. I hope this has helped you in some way. I hope this has helped you reimagine the world and everything that the Lord wants it to be so that we can work towards this purpose and bring glory to our Heavenly Father. Thank you for watching. Until next time, you take care and God bless.